So thank you all for coming today to Southwell. Welcome to people who uh, join us today for the first time. I hope you had a relatively good journey here. And um, do not forget to write your name and leave us your contact details. And most importantly, tell us how you heard about our event. We are very happy to welcome you to this meeting. This meeting is um, a launch, a book launch of a book um, I'm personally very excited and very happy about. It looks fantastic. Jot is holding it. Shows be one of the most beautiful uh, representations of humanity. Um, a man and a woman, two workers united in struggle. It is an amazing art uh, in, created in the Soviet Union. And you will discover why it, um, it is in the front cover of this pamphlet. Um, it, it is a reminder, like this book is a reminder of some uh, fundamental truths. Uh, that it is not merely um, the injustices that we all find that um, are important, but uh, we fight the system that perpetuates these injustices, and that is capitalism and imperialism. So this book, in many ways, reminds us of this fundamental truth. Um, and we think it is very, very important to remain vigilant against the encroachment of ideologies that uh, seek to divert our attention from the true enemy that is capitalism and imperialism. Um, of course, identity politics for many people, especially young people who are educated to think like that um, from a very early years, um, it's supposed to be about the grievances and the problems and all the issues uh, surrounding uh, oppressed groups, marginalized uh, groups. So it is uh, perceived to be something progressive. But as the thesis of uh, the book is, and Jyoti will explain, it serves as a smoke screen. It is a smoke screen for bourgeois individualism. And as many of you have been discussing just right before the meeting, I could uh, hear your discussions. It is, it's fostering a culture, a very toxic culture of false antagonisms where we are encouraged to vie against the, each other to see who is the most oppressed for this dubious honor. And in doing so, of course, we lose sight of the real enemy, the class enemy, the capitalist ruling class that, of course, profits from, from this division uh, to exploit us further. So uh, without further ado, I would like you all to welcome our vice chair, the vice chair of the Communist uh, Party of Great Britain, Marxist Leninist, who authored this, this book, and uh, to sharing her insights. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. You know, in some ways, I feel like, well, Christina just said it all, and we can probably just go home now. <laughs> um, I found it really, really, really hard to cut down what is actually a very small, you know, it's a big topic. And I wrote a very brief overview summation of the topic. It's not an in-depth, you know, blow by blow, take everybody who's ever written something stupid and refute it type of a book. It's an overview of how you can do that by yourself. Um, and as a result, it's quite spare. And I didn't want to take anything out of this in presenting it to you. So I had a real trouble to cut down my text to something that will fit in a presentation. And uh, I hope you feel at the end of it, I haven't butchered it so much that I, you know, I haven't properly explained myself. And on the other hand, it's still too long. <laughs> it's a kind of a, a conundrum that you're in when you want to, 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 to present something in a shortened form that was already, as far as you were concerned, as brief as it could be. <laughs> Uh, so I will do my best. Um, you will have to, I hope we're going to have a conversation at the end of my presentation. Um, and you can, you know, tell me the bits that you felt weren't clear or need talking about more. And um, I really hope, it's a very small pamphlet. It's like, what, 100 pages long, including the footnotes. So I really, really hope that you will take a copy away with you. Um, not because we're trying to make money, but because, you know, we produce things because we think the 
the education is needed for our class. And this is a question. Identity politics is not a new thing. It, it seems to have taken on a new and hysterical form in the last decade. But actually, you know, and I'll, I'll come to this in the talk, you know, our comrades, the comrades who founded our party, have been fighting identity politics in different forms right from the beginning of their political lives in the 1960s. Um, and I think that's also important for us to, to understand that the latest iteration didn't come out of nowhere. You know, what's the tradition it's come out of? What's the trend it represents? Where does it all come from? So um, I'm going to just start by talking a bit about liberalism. Because, of course, the big confusion that happens in our movement is between liberalism and socialism. And it's constantly presented to ourselves that a liberal is a lefty, is a socialist. And those things are not true. <laughs> so I'm just going to start with a quote from our old friend, or certainly my old friend, Joseph Stalin. Uh, he wrote, the hub of modern social life is the class struggle. In the course of this struggle, each class is guided by its own ideology. The bourgeoisie has its own ideology, so-called liberalism. The proletariat also has its own ideology. This, as is well known, is socialism. Now, of course, today it's less well known. This is a truth, a well-known truth uh, in 1907 when Stalin wrote those words, a lot less well known in the British working class today. Um, so I think it's really important for us to put this all in a kind of historical context. You know, liberalism was the ideology of the rising bourgeoisie. And it had a revolutionary origin. The main content of liberalism is an emphasis on the rights of the individual. Now, if you understand that that grew out of the struggle against feudalism, you know, the bourgeoisie fought to overthrow serfdom and wherever it fought against landed aristocracies, absolute monarchies, you know, the, 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 the control of the church, it did so under the slogan of the liberty and equality of all men. So that was against a hierarchical feudal system that said you're born in your place and you can never move from it. If you're born a serf, you'll die a serf and you'll get your reward in heaven, right? Um, so it had a revolutionary content in that context. Of course, once the capitalists were in power we started to see the limits of their slogans. Because as the new rulers of society, working to secure their position and disarm the workers who had supported them in the struggle against feudalism, it became clear that liberty and equality were not going to be extended to the unpropertied masses. They were not going to be extended to women, to slaves, or to colonized peoples. And as a minority ruling class, the capitalists, like the feudal and the slave-owning exploiters who came before them, they set about modifying their ideals in order to fit them to their new position as masters of society, as an exploiting class whose power came from monopolizing the wealth produced by the exploited masses. You know, in the early days of the bourgeoisie, of bourgeois rule, they were really into science and scientific discoveries. They opened up the whole world to scientific investigation. But once discoveries of science began to come into conflict with the goal of preserving their class rule and the capitalist system of production, scientific investigation itself started to come under attack. We got all kinds of pseudoscience and all kinds of, you know, and, and this is where we start to get the beginnings of this kind of hypocrisy and the clash between the words and the deeds of the ruling class becomes very evident as it becomes a decaying class that's holding on against science to its position. Um, Georgi Plekhanov, who was the founder of Russian Marxism, in 1907, he wrote, Marx very truly said that the greater the development of the contradiction between the growing productive forces and the existing social order, the more does the ideology of the master class become imbued with hypocrisy. So this was already noticeable more than 100 years ago. And if it's very glaring today, you can see why that is. The more the falseness of this ideology is revealed by life, the more elevated and virtuous does the language of the class become. And then Lenin, just a year later, wrote this. There is a well-known saying, if geometrical axioms affected human interests, attempts would certainly be made to refute them. 
Theories of natural history, are, for example, he's talking about Darwin's theory of evolution, which conflicted with the old prejudices of theology provoked and still provoke the most rabid opposition. No wonder, therefore, that the Marxian doctrine, which directly serves to enlighten and organize the advanced class in modern society, indicates the tasks facing this class and demonstrates the inevitable replacement by virtue of economic development of the present system by a new order, no wonder that this doctrine has had to fight for every step forward in the course of its life. You know, it's a long time since bourgeois liberalism had any revolutionary or progressive content. It's a long time since it's been anything more than empty rhetoric used to cover the actions of our rulers that are actually completely in contradiction even with their own professed ideals. Today, when a tiny parasitic bourgeoisie presides over vicious death throes of a decaying monopoly capitalist system, the role of liberal ideology is entirely reactionary and totally hypocritical. And this is something even the most uneducated and unconnected worker sees and feels today. There's a huge disconnect now, isn't there, between ordinary people and politicians and media. And the reason is they know that they're being lied to and they know that the words are hypocritical. They know that when politicians say they care about the people, they're lying. <laughs> they know that, they feel it, they've lived it and they've seen in practice how the words and the deeds are so far apart from one another. So, so far we've looked at liberalism as a whole, but when it comes to identity politics, the trend within liberalism we're really interested in is the left of liberalism. Left liberals, like all liberals, ultimately work to maintain the rule of the bourgeoisie. But they believe the best way to ensure capitalism's survival is to try to reform the system's worst aspects and give it a friendlier face. Uh, and often they'll dress their goals up in socialist terminology uh, because that will make it more acceptable to working people. You know, the right-wing liberals' arrogance towards the oppressed workers at home and abroad upsets left liberals because they've been affected by the progress of the movement for socialism and national liberation in the last century, just enough to be embarrassed by blatantly chauvinist attitudes. Left liberalism is infused with concepts of guilt and privilege, and it puts forward a practical programme of conscience-salving activities. How can we feel better about the fact that we were born on the lucky side of this unpleasant divide? Left liberalism informs the ideology of a minority of the Labour Party, the left wing of the Labour Party, and of left Labour's various left hangers-on, Trotskyites, revisionists, you know, all of those types that very often claim to be Marxists. But in fact, if you look at the content of their policy and really the aims they pursue, it's left liberalism that guides them. From the left liberal standpoint, it's entirely respectable to criticise the worst aspects and abuses of capitalist imperialism, but only if the solutions on offer don't actually threaten the system of capitalist production relations. Marxism, which is scientific socialism, has nothing in common with left liberalism. It is the political ideology of the proletariat. Hands up, who knows what the proletariat is? I'm just checking everyone's listening. Right? Property-less property wage workers, yes? People who can only survive by selling their labour power to someone who is going to make money out of them. The class whose interests are entirely opposed to those of the bourgeoisie. In order to present a program that seems to be plausible, left liberals promote the idea that the job of political activists is first and foremost to change the attitudes of individuals. Socialists, on the other hand, strive to change the economic and social system that creates and shapes those attitudes. With the development of monopoly capitalism and the ever increasing concentration of capital into fewer and fewer hands, the ruling class is becoming an ever tinier minority of the population. And since that is the case, it has to work really, really hard to keep devising ways to divide the working class against itself in order to maintain its rule. 
number one priority of the ruling class is to stop the working class understanding that it's a class and that it has a common interest. Its agents in the working class movement and in the universities work incessantly to corrupt Marxism, which is the principal weapon of the working class in organizing against capitalist rule. They work both to remove the revolutionary content from Marxism, which is why universities are full of people claiming to be Marxists, none of whom actually are, and to separate Marxism <laughs> that resonated with somebody, <laughs> and to separate Marxism from the mass of the working class. So the ruling class knows, as the workers do not, just what a threat their organization under the banner of Marxist science would represent to decaying capitalist rule. And identity politics in the last 40, 50 years have presented or provided some of the principal levers used by the bourgeoisie to effect divisions within the working class and undermine the movement for socialism. So I think it's worth taking a little bit of time to review the main trends of identity politics that have poisoned the British left since the 1960s so we can put the most recent branches of IDPOL uh, and particularly the so-called uh, trans-liberation movement into a historical context and understand where it came from. Um, and I have to just say again here I've massively butchered these sections of the talk compared to what's in the pamphlet. The pamphlet was a very brief, as brief as I could make it overview. And in order to make it briefer, I've sort of cut it down to almost nothing. So apologies to how significant these movements are that I've summed them up so um, uh, shallowly, let's say, um, because they're super important. And just so you know, I should have brought a copy up here. Um, so the women's movement, the women's movement in Britain of the 1960s and 70s, our comrades uh, worked in that movement. My mother and father, after the years, along with the anti-Vietnam War movement, you know, they had their political baptism as Marxists in the women's movement. And um, thank you, darling. Could you do? Could I get a bourgeois nationalism as well? Thank you. So this book here, you can see it's quite a big book. <laughs> this documents our comrades' experience in that movement and the struggle they had trying to bring a Marxist understanding to what was a big mass working class movement of women in the, in the late 1960s. Sadly, they were forced out and the movement was dominated by bourgeois feminists. And of course, the problem with bourgeois feminism is that its approach can basically be summed up as the root cause of the inequality faced by women is the nastiness of men. Right? And they encourage us to believe that the fight we faced was a battle of the sexes, in which men and women are implacable enemies. Right? Nowhere in the feminist analysis was there any understanding of the fact that women perform a social role which has been hidden under conditions of domestic slavery, but nevertheless is a social role. When they undertake child rearing, caring, household duties, these are jobs that society needs to be done. Society can't last very long if they're not being done, right? Needs that, it's socially necessary work, but it's socially necessary uh, character has been hidden during the course of the entire period of human civilization, that class society. So as soon as women became uh, private servitors rather than public workers, it looked as though the work they were doing was just for their husbands or for their families. But it's for society. Society needs that work to be done. In primitive societies, it was obvious that this is social work. It was undertaken collectively in communal homes. Um, there was no... There was no higher or lower status, although there was a divide between who did what, men and women. It was based on physical you know, uh, capabilities it, uh, and, and, uh, and abilities. It was not based on better or worse. Right? It was just everything that needed doing gets done. And women did their work in public, communally, and it was obviously social work and respected as such. And of course, under socialism, such work will once more be recognized and performed as social labor only this time on the basis of modern technique. 
That's why socialists, when we're addressing the women's question, we put the emphasis on the public provision of services alongside demands for equality before the law, equality of access to education and jobs and all of that. But it's the focus on the public provision of services is what really enables all women to be liberated, not only those from the more privileged classes who can afford to pay for help in the home in order to go out to work. Most of the solutions on offer from the feminist movement, on the other hand, um, offered nothing to working class women. They ranged from refusing to have children or being sexually promiscuous because that's like freeing yourself to behave like a man in a man's world, right? This is equality. Um, bra burning because your bra is a symbol of your oppression. Um, ideological lesbianism. I'd said this to, to some people. They were like, what? Genuinely was a thing where people said, well, kick the enemy out of your bed. If it's men versus women, why are you sleeping with the enemy? Um, and none of this found any sympathy, as you can imagine, amongst working class women who the mass of them were turned off by this. They basically were demobilized. And the feminist movement, uh, you know, kind of went into the universities, became a respected area of women's studies and all that nonsense. Um, so the, the working class women who had joined this big women's movement in the 1960s, their concerns were centered around the daily issues they faced. You know, extra burdens placed on them by responsibility for household chores and family caring, low pay rates for women's work outside the home, and legal and social second class status, which was still, you know, very much in force in the 1960s, legally, as well as, you know, by tradition and force of habit. So their interest in politics had been sparked by a desire to be treated as equals in society and to have their excessive burdens lightened. And of course, that's all in the wake of all of the achievements of women in the socialist countries, Soviet Union in particular. Our comrades tried to bring to this mass movement an understanding that the question of women's emancipation is first and foremost a class question. And that the solution... and that the solution is to be found in the working class struggle for socialism. Their analysis was based on the profound work done by Friedrich Engels in his groundbreaking work, The Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State. And I'm sure all of you know, but for the benefit of anybody who doesn't, you know, this is absolutely essential reading for anyone who wants to understand not only the women's question, but the, the history of humanity in general. It's the most phenomenal history book you will ever read and will make sense of a you know, million things that you never had a context for before. Um, Engel's analysis was borne out by the experience and the practical programs of every socialist society from the Soviet Union onward. In the fight for socialism, working class men are not the enemies of women, but their allies. They struggle together. That's why we chose this <laughs> picture for the front of the book. That's what all of the struggles for socialism proved in practice. Who benefits from telling working class men that their dignity will be undermined if their women folk are too independent or strong minded? What was the word they used to use for that? Too bolshy? <laughs> There's a reason for that. Who benefits from telling working class women that their men folk are the enemy of their liberty? It's only the capitalists. Creating division amongst the ranks of the exploited is a necessity for any minority ruling class. And remember that the minority ruling class we have today is the smallest ruling class the world has ever known, and it's getting smaller year by year. Right? This, is not, this is not a joke. This is serious business for the ruling class. They need to confuse us and get us fighting one another constantly. And if you want to get to socialism, your first job is to show working people how that's being done to them so that they can start to unite as a class and stop turning all their frustration and anger onto each other. You know, the idea of half the workforce forgetting their place and taking a full part in the political life of the country puts the fear of God into the ruling class and with very good reason. For those who haven't read up on the history of the Russian Revolution, it was actually a women's demonstration which kicked off the February Revolution of 1917. Working class women on the streets demanding peace 
and bread. The history of all proletarian revolutions and national liberation movements shows that no revolution can succeed without the participation of working class women, while with women's de determined and mass participation, the movement becomes unstoppable. So this is not a theoretical and abstract question for us either. There's a reason why we vehemently oppose bourgeois feminism, because it's a trick of the ruling class to keep us fighting one another. It's not going to lead to the liberation of women, the mass of working class women. It's a way to prettify the system. So the next big target of identity politics is, of course, the anti-racist movement. I'll show you another book. This book written by my father, Bourgeois Nationalism or Proletarian Internationalism, Comrade Hopal Bra, wrote this book and it documents the experience of his comrades in the anti-racist movement of the 1970s and 1980s. And once again, they were one of the lone voices trying to bring a class perspective to a topic that was being taken over by petty bourgeois ideologists and turned into its opposite. So as in the women's movement, so in the anti-racist movement, our party's founding comrades for many decades set themselves the task of countering the ideas being put about by bourgeois black nationalists, which can be summed up in the assertion that the root cause of the inequality faced by black and other dark-skinned minorities in Britain is the nastiness of white people in general, and that racist attitudes are intrinsic to those who are born with white skins. As with the feminists, the programmatic demands of bourgeois anti-racism take the mass of the working class absolutely nowhere. They range from setting up a parallel black capitalism, yeah, I'm sure you've all read ideas like this, where black politicians rule over black workers who are all employed by or patronise businesses run by black people, um, to demanding equal rights for black people in the current setup to be fairly represented in capitalist boardrooms. So, you know, will black people have a proportionate share of jobs among the top earners uh, in business, media and politics? That's equality. None of this, of course, gets at the root causes of racism, which are actually fueled by the system of capitalist exploitation itself, and especially by the latest imperialist stage of capitalism. The divide and rule requirements of the minority ruling class at home, and especially the need for justifications for imperialist war, occupation, and looting abroad. It's not an accident that the deluge of racist propaganda in Britain began with Britain's colonization of parts of the world abroad. It doesn't do anything to advance the lot of the mass of poorer black workers, this program of let's set up a black capitalism or let's have enough black people represented in all the you know, various occupations. They're unlikely to feel any better because the face fronting their exploitation or even leading an armed assault against them is black and not white. And we only have to look at the lot of poor black workers in the USA during Barack Obama's presidency for proof of this. Not to mention the lot of dark skinned workers in Libya, Afghanistan and Syria as they faced the bombs and guns sent against them by the man black nationalists at the time labeled Brother Obama. Right? And they said his election was a great step forward against racism. And of course, who was he ably and enthusiastically assisted by? The feminist favourite warmonger, Sister Hillary. <laughs> but if you want to really understand that racism is not a question of the colour of your skin, you have to go back to the beginnings of British imperialism and colonialism. Because... Imperialism is not about white supremacy, it is an economic system. The first minority groups to suffer persecution and second-class citizenship in Britain had white skins. The Jews, for example, were a primary scapegoat of choice all over Europe from the Middle Ages onwards, as were Romani travellers. 
But in the era of developing industrial capitalism, the most vilified group of workers in Britain were the Irish. The Irish. And their case really set the pattern for the treatment of all later groups of super-exploited workers who arrived in Britain. So um, I really wanted to read it all to you because it's really interesting and fun, but I've had to cut it, most of it out. Um, but Ireland's relationship to Britain was a classic, the classic colonial relationship, right? Ireland served as a source of food for Britain's industrial workforce, of raw materials to fuel its industrial machinery, and Irish workers were the first to emigrate to Britain in large numbers. They came because the British looting of Ireland had made life impossible for a large percentage of Irish peasants who were being steadily, steadily impoverished and reduced to starvation. We know millions died as a result of imperialist engendered famine, during which plenty of good food continued to be exported from Ireland to Britain. Is that not the exact same story we've seen in so many African colonies in more recent times, in India? And are not the poor starving people in those countries presented to us as if something about their Indianness or their Africanness makes them liable to famine? Marx and Engels wrote frequently and in great detail about the importance of the artificial hostility and divide that was created between these two great camps of workers in Britain and described it as the secret of continued British bourgeois rule. They described how British-born workers had been taught to identify with the ruling class on the basis of their shared Britishness, to look down on the Irish and thus to accept both the second-class status of Irish workers in Britain and the colonisation of Ireland by the British ruling class as a natural and civilising act towards a backward people. Now, you can just replace the name with any other colonised people into that and you'll get the same story of every bit, corner of the British Empire, right? So when people describe imperialism as white supremacy... This is a sleight of hand which hides what's really going on and is actually furthers the ruling class's aim of making white workers identify with the white ruling class. You as a white worker must feel guilty about white supremacy. No, we weren't the ones who were benefiting from the pillage and the plunder of the world. For a lot of the time, there have been parts of our history when the mass of British workers did benefit from it and today still do to some extent. But at the time when industrial capital was forming, the poverty of the British working class was likened by Tory commentators to slavery in the southern states of America. Actually, they used it as a justification for saying maybe slavery is not that bad because the slave owner takes better care of the slaves than the industrial capitalist takes of the children who are being worked to death in his factories. So they rolled out this formula to A Asia and Africa, this myth of, of civilising the unfit races. It's a very successful formula, uh, both for dividing the working class at home and for justifying imperial crimes abroad. Um, and so they had no hesitation in reusing this template as their empire expanded around the globe. And then after World War II, when they were importing hundreds of thousands of workers from around the empire to help rebuild Britain after the war, the model went into full effect again to make sure that the Caribbean and Asian populations who made up the bulk of those who immigrated into Britain at that time were brought in as a ghettoized underclass. And of course, the fact that most of these immigrants had dark skin made the job of dividing the working class that much easier, um, especially because systematic propaganda regarding the unfitness of the darker races to rule themselves had been going on for a century or more, while the British Empire sought to dress up its brutal role in the slave trade and the extension of its ruthless domination across Asia and Africa as a force for progress and civilization. Well, they're still doing that today, aren't they? They pretend the age of empire is over. But when you look at the words they use to justify their aggressive wars and operations around the world, it's still in the name of progress and civilization, human rights, democratic values. 
Class conscious workers have always understood that the solution to the problem of racism is to do away with minority class rule. It is a minority exploiting class that needs divide and rule. It's not in the interest of the working class. There's nothing intrinsically racist about any of us. It's been fostered. There's a culture in this country, as an imperialist country, we, were, we are all infected with racism, including the brown and black people, against foreigners. We're all infected with anti-immigration prejudices, including the brown and black people in this country. Huge sentiment. It's amazing how you don't have to have been in Britain for very long to start being anti-immigration. This is a culture which is created by the ruling class, permeates everywhere and everything, dominates the political discourse and shapes people's mindset, no matter what their skin colour or even for very often their own family history. If a, if a minority ruling class wants to maintain its exalted position, it has to keep us divided. It has to stop workers recognising their common identity as proletarians exploited by capital. In just the same way, the imperialists can't allow a situation to prevail in which Brit British workers easily recognise their common identity with workers around the globe as victims of British imperialist plunder and exploitation. How will our rulers find workers willing to fight in their wars abroad? What would stop the workers at home and abroad uniting against imperialism if we didn't have a racist culture in this country? It is essential part of imperialism to have racism and you will not solve it any way than by removing that system of minority class rule. The accidents of history that put Europeans in a position to colonize the rest of the world in the modern era that led to humans in Europe having paler skins than those of humans elsewhere, these have provided extremely useful material for the division of workers in the imperialist countries on the basis of skin color. And of course, that is material that the ruling class has been very quick to seize on and extremely enthusiastic in spreading. But in the end, it has nothing to do with the color of anybody's skin. <laughs> And you can see that from the fact that the ruling class themselves are quite happy to hobnob with people of all colours, as long as they're the right class background and attitude, got enough money, they can be in the club. <laughs> Decades of bourgeois feminism and bourgeois nationalism in our movement had some really tragic results, actually, for the working class movement. And that's in a situation where there wasn't a strong communist movement to counter this ideology and its spread has been really rampant. We basically saw the sabotage of what had been, had had the potential to be vibrant movements, bringing large numbers of working class black Asian workers, large numbers of working class women into the struggle for socialism. We've had the self-defeating rejection of scientific socialism by these movements on the basis that, oh, it's been written by white men and therefore it's irrelevant, it's Eurocentric, it's man-centric. Uh, and this way, people have been taught to cut themselves off from the highest achievements of human knowledge and it's knowledge that they desperately need. It's a massive own goal for our movement. We've had the widest possible propagation of the fake solutions on offer from bourgeois nationalists and, and, and bourgeois feminists both to the question of women's oppression and the question of racism. And these are propagated in the corporate media um, and you know, across our education systems. And the systematic burying of the understanding that both these questions are first and foremost class questions. And we've had the creation of fields of so-called women's studies and race studies in academia which have spent decades now brainwashing university students with false consciousness, creating dreams of literature, uh, and that have created this identity-led discourse that is now totally unquestioned by any in the petty bourgeois left, in quotes, left, that left. The left of bourgeois politics left. Um, it's led to a wide acceptance of the laughable idea that the state machinery that's controlled by a class that depends on the divisions that have been stoked by institutional racism, 
depends on oppressed women performing a huge amount of socially necessary but unpaid labor, really needs to keep the mass of working women out of political and social life, that state machinery can be trusted to oversee the implementation of equality yeah. via legislation, via policing, and initiatives like gender pay gap reports and virtue signaling tokenistic educational cultural initiatives like Black History Month, etc. Right? That this is all the path to liberation and equality. I mean, if you stop and think about it even for a second, it's a joke. Most people feel they're being laughed at with this rubbish, right? They know. It's like when you turn on the telly and every single advert's got a black man and a brown man in it, or there's a black woman driving a posh car. It's like, how did that suddenly happen? But did life suddenly get better in, 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 the real, in the rest of the real world because suddenly all the adverts have got beautiful black ladies driving Mercedes? It, we know we're being patronized, don't we? We know we're being lied to, just the same as we were being lied to when you never saw a black face on the telly. You know, this is, this is not what equality looks like. A growing acceptance and propagation of the racist idea that workers with family origins outside Britain do not belong here and cannot find liberation until they either return home or are given some kind of self-sufficient territory of their own, uh, which might be within Britain or might be elsewhere, uh, as we saw, for example, in the case of Israel, uh, where they can exercise self-rule, which is often described as national liberation, um, and this notion falls apart, really, as soon as you consider children of mixed parentage or fourth or fifth generation descent, you know? Where do you stop when you start saying that you've got to separate people according to their, you know, ethnic origin in the modern world? And, of course, it's led to a huge and widening rift between privileged university-educated workers whose minds have been thoroughly infected with both these discourses, with bourgeois feminist and bourgeois nationalist academic discourses of guilt and privilege, and who look down on poorer workers who don't buy into it to the same extent because they haven't spent as many years having it thrown at their heads <clears throat> and don't really have any truck with it, and poorer, less educated workers who despise what they see as nonsense of these kind of tropes of like, all white people are racist or men are our enemies. Like, if you haven't spent years being brainwashed and confused by bourgeois ideology in academia, it's fairly obvious that that's nonsense, right? It takes a systematic attack on your understanding of life uh, for you to feel so shaken in your understanding of the world, that you're open to all these ideas that, oh, I'm white, I'm inherently guilty. Mm. And of course, the real tragedy is, for people on both sides of that divide, they've been brought to believe, it's particularly by the media, that this is, this is what progressive politics look like. Um, so then we come on to the... the LGBT plus uh, liberation and how it's really a deliberate confusion of many concepts. So, you know, for decades, serious Marxists of the type that we here are proudly descended from just kept away from all these academic debates around gay rights. Uh, they saw them, uh, rightly saw them, as a distraction and an irrelevance to the struggle for socialist revolution. You know, the simple fact is, and you, I don't know, it seems to me like it's, a, it's so obvious it seems weird to have to say it, but who a person has sex with, right? Let's assume it's between consenting adults, no money changed hands, you know. It's not a class issue in the sense that it's not central programmatic issue for workers struggling for socialism, right? Seems like a no-brainer to, to me, but, you know, apparently it's not. But the confusion of sexual questions with class issues isn't actually as new as we're made to think it is. It began among bourgeois feminists actually in the 19th century. And it was transferred from the bourgeois feminist movement into the gay liberation movement of the 1960s. So they didn't begin this obsession with sex. It was a bourgeois obsession. They picked it up from the women's feminist movement and they just plonked it into their programme. 
Um, you know, it is right for people to recognize and point out that the oppressive and hypocritical sexual morality of class society is a fetter on human relationships. Workers long looked forward to a future in which love and sex would cease to be mixed up with questions of class and property. But to move from this understanding that the coming social revolution will revolutionize all our relationships with one another, all of them, parents to children, teachers to school kids, you know, bosses to, well, we won't have the bosses, but you know, people who work in the, and to managers to, to shop floor workers, whatever, all our relationships are gonna be revolutionized by changing the relations of production. That's a true thing. That includes our sexual relationships, but not only our sexual relationships. For, to move from this understanding to the idea that we must make sexual matters an object of primary concern before the revolution, that is putting the cart before the horse and getting yourself totally upside down. Mm -hmm. You know, a century ago, more than a century ago, in 1920, Clara Zetkin reported on a conversation she had with Lenin. Clara Zetkin, uh, for those who don't know, was a German communist and working class women's leader. Um, and at this moment in time, the Soviet revolution was like two and a half years old, was fighting for its life against 14 armies of intervention. The German revolution was facing a massive counter-revolution during which most of its people were executed over the course of the next few years. So this is what was happening in the German working class movement at that time. And this is what Lenin said to Clara. I have been told that at the evenings arranged for reading and discussion with working women, sex and marriage problems come first. They are said to be the main objects of interest in your political instruction and educational work. I could not believe my ears when I heard that. The first state of proletarian dictatorship is battling with the counter-revolutionaries of the whole world. The situation in Germany itself calls for the greatest unity of all proletarian revolutionary forces so that they can repel the counter-revolution which is pushing on. But active communist women are busy discussing sex problems and the forms of marriage, past, present and future. The quote was quite long, so I cut a bit out. He talks about Freud. He said, Freud's theory has now become a fad. I mistrust sex theories expounded in articles, treatises, pamphlets, etc. In short, the theories dealt with in that specific literature, which sprouts so luxuriantly on the dung heap of bourgeois society. I love that expression. <laughs> I mistrust those who are always absorbed in the sex problems, the way an Indian saint is absorbed in the contemplation of his navel. No matter how rebellious and revolutionary it may be made to appear, it is in the final analysis thoroughly bourgeois. Intellectuals and others like them are particularly keen on this. There is no room for it in the party among the class conscious fighting proletariat. Why is the approach to this problem inadequate and unmarxist? Because sex and marriage problems are not treated only as part of the main social problem. Conversely, the main social problem is presented as a part an appendage to the sex problem. The important point recedes into the background. Thus, not only is this question obscured, but also thought and the class consciousness of working women in general is dulled. This point of Lenin's, I think, is really key. There is nothing to be gained for the revolution by focusing serious attention on trying to solve class society induced problems of sex and relationships before the revolution. These are questions workers will solve as socialism develops into communism and all the remaining traces of class society disappear from their lives, their minds, and their culture. You know, again, it feels like you shouldn't have to say it, but socialists are opposed to any discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation, but we're equally opposed to the propagation of such misleading phrases as the LGBT community, which do nothing to enlighten anybody and in fact just spread confusion. Since when did having a particular sexual preference make you part of a community? The bourgeoisie loves hitting us over the head with the word community 
but it does it in ways that act not to unite people, but to divide them. In this case, by encouraging them to identify with other gay people, no matter what their class, where they live, and to think that the path to freedom is going to be found in living in a gay ghetto, buying into corporate-driven identities that dictate their taste in clothes, music, decor, even how they walk and talk, which are all supposed somehow to be tied to their sexual preferences. It's shit, isn't it? This is, this is just marketing. You know, as with bourgeois solutions to racism and sexism, the bourgeois solution to homophobia is to increase ghettoization in the name of fighting it. And when we look a little closer, we see that the fight for gay rights has actually been promoted as part of a subtle campaign to demote and divert the women's struggle and the fight against racism, both of which will only be solved by socialist revolution, into a similarly harmless agenda of rights, i.e. to turn them into struggles that promote the idea of legal rec recognition of equality as the ultimate solution to problems which are actually built into the capitalist state machinery and which no amount of legislation by the capitalist state is ever going to remedy. So we have to understand again that institutional sexism stems from the oppression of women that goes hand in hand with any type of class society. And the capitalists can't afford to socialize the work that women do privately and for nothing. Nor can they afford to provide the, the facilities that will free women from the burdens placed on them. Nor are they going to provide meaningful work for them in the capitalist labor market. Nor do they want them to be freed en masse to take part in political life. No matter how many better off working women find a way to carve out careers for themselves under conditions of capitalism, the masses of working class women will still be trained from birth to accept their lot and carry out their domestic duties. And I did put a little section in the pamphlet about how with the abolition of the welfare state, gender stereotypes being pushed on our young working class girls are actually going back the other direction, and getting worse again, getting stronger. The training of girls to accept their role as the caregivers and the runners of homes and families has become stronger again as the welfare state is being dismantled in Britain. In the same way, institutional racism stems from the oppression of the colonies and from imperialist war, as well as from the need to keep workers divided at home. The imperialist ruling class can no more stop fighting wars for domination and plunder than it can stop the anarchy of private production. No matter how many better off black or ethnic minority workers find a way to carve out careers under capitalism, the masses of working class black people or Irish or Muslims or whoever fits the agenda of the day will still be treated unfairly by the state and routinely harassed and criminalized in order to perpetuate whatever stereotypes the ruling class needs to help it justify its wars at this particular moment. Right? We see the target, the primary state target of racism change. And if you're in a group that used to be really persecuted and no longer is, it can feel to you like, oh, we've made great progress. We're not racist anymore. <laughs> you're not the group that's being targeted anymore. Right? But if you look around you, there's always a group that is being targeted. Right? So the need for that persecution and, and to have a targeted group in society never goes under the present system. But that's not the case with the other rights lobbies, which is why they're so assiduously promoted and why the struggle against the struggle for uh, against women's oppression and against racism is equalized with all the other rights lobbies to present it like it's the same type of a struggle when it isn't you know you can meet the demands of the gay rights lobby without undermining the basis of capitalist exploitation have to understand that this is why the gay rights question is not on the program of the communists it's not because we approve of discrimination or prejudice. It's because it's not a question that impinges on the relations of production. And our program is about getting to socialism, not about abolishing prejudice. A side effect of getting to socialism is we'll build a world where prejudice can wither away. <laughs> and of course, a side effect of struggling for socialism is that workers in the struggle overcome their prejudices. 
by working together in that struggle. We don't have to put it in our program. It will happen. Meeting all the demands of the gay rights lobby is perfectly possible without undermining the basis of capitalist exploitation. And of course, it has the added bonus of helping to confuse workers about what the fight for social justice really looks like. Plus, of course, it gives the exploiting class the opportunity to take to itself the mantle of the defender of workers' liberties. How sickening has it been for us to see the pinkwashing of the fascistic Zionist state of Israel as it's carrying out its steady genocide of Palestinians? How disgusting is it to see the crocodile tears shed by the imperialists over the rights of women and gay people in, in Iran, anti-imperialist Iran, while they're sanctioning it to the hilt and trying to strangle the same people that they claim to want to protect. How are we all doing? Can you cope with more of this? Yes. 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 Just warming up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have to... I have to apologize that it's long. It was about as short as I could manage. So then we come to this issue of the hierarchy of pain. Now I'm sure you as politically engaged and literate people have all come across and been infuriated by this uh, takeover of meaningful struggles um, and, and this, this diverting of them into, into paths that are so not just harmless to the ruling class, but obviously nonsensical and harmful to ourselves. I want to quote from you a couple of uh, sentences from a resolution uh, our party passed in September 2018 at our eighth party congress about the October Revolution. It says this, after October 1917, the imperialists lost the moral high ground. When Soviet policy proved in practice the fallacy of bourgeois justifications for racism and national oppression, which of course were that colonized people were unfit to rule themselves, and for sexism, which were that women were physically and mentally incapable of doing men's work. The popular sentiment turned against imperialism for good. The fact that modern day imperialists are forced to pay lip service to equality and human rights is a telling legacy of October. The imperialists are on the back foot. We should recognize that, have been since, since 1917. They used to shout their racism proudly from the rooftops. Now they have to say it quietly to each other when the cameras are not rolling and the microphones have been switched off, right? That is because of the advance of the working class movement. It's because of socialism that that has happened. These are not the Western democratic values. These are socialist values forced on our ruling class. They speak them hypocritically. They don't mean them, but they've been forced to do it because the popular masses have seen that it was BS. And they can't justify their existence as a ruling class unless they claim to be on the side of the workers on those questions now. But having been forced onto the back foot by the advances of the Soviet Union and the socialist camp, having lost that moral high ground in terms of the ideological dominance of workers' minds, the ruling class worked hard to turn the new reality where it has to accept in words, if not in deeds, that there's no moral justification for sexism, for racism or colonial oppression. They have to try and find ways to turn that reality to their advantage. Ever since it's been forced to make some concessions in the direction of equal rights for women and ethnic minorities, the ruling class has done its best to manipulate the struggle around these vital issues away from alignment with the class struggle and into harmless dead ends of debates over rights and privilege. And, you know, cementing this diversion away from class politics, any number of other minority groups against whom there has ever been any prejudice in society have been brought forward to join this equal rights agenda. So whether stigmatized or sidelined as a result of mental or physical disabilities, ill health, old age, you know, anything. And for the benefit of those who are determined to misrepresent our views of whom their numbers are legion, mm -hmm. we repeat that communists are in favor of workers being treated equally. 
And it's a sign of how muddied our waters have become by individualism and the politics of identity that this should need to be stated. The point is not that communists are opposed to equal opportunities or equal rights, but we understand that those will not come while capitalist exploitation and the drive for profit continue to divide humanity into exploited and exploiters, continue to concentrate the wealth of society into fewer and fewer hands while impoverishing the vast masses. You know, taking advantage of the confusion already created in this area, the proponents of identity politics, and especially those working in academia, are increasingly encouraging all workers to find a special minority with which to identify and to imagine that the real or imagined difficulties associated with living as part of that minority give them some kind of precedence over others. The question of racism, for example, having been first transformed into a simple dichotomy of white versus black, has then been minutely subdivided into grades of oppression related solely to the darkness of your skin. So in this hierarchy of suffering, to be perceived as more repressed mm -hmm. is also to be recognised not only of being worthy of more sympathy and the object of more guilt, but also as being inherently more progressive. So it's like you're, just, you're born progressive according to how dark or light your melatonin is, right? This is a travesty of the concept that makes a mockery and a farce out of working class politics, but is all too often put forward in the name of Marxism. I've seen people arguing it. It's embarrassing, um, but it's very widespread. And the effect of all this is particularly noticeable among the student population, exposed to what seemed to them to be universally accepted truths for years and from all sides, and expected to repeat them in their essays if their studies have any connection with art, politics, history, or social life. And so it's not surprising that identity-driven agendas are being introduced wholesale into the working class movement by thoroughly indoctrinated student activists and their academic mentors. And this is the situation that produces the disgusting spectacle, really disgusting spectacle, of better off and patently privileged workers vying with one another to claim a place in the officially recognised and constantly evolving, I mean, I can't keep, keep up with it, not that I care that much, hierarchy of pain and oppression. Right? So we're treated to a ridiculous ex exhibition of competitive suffering that is mainly indulged in by those who are in reality suffering significantly less than the mass of poor workers in this country and exponentially less than the mass of impoverished workers around the world. So it's kind of obscene, really, isn't it? And many of whom, when we think about globally, many of those people really do have trouble finding a safe space, really. A safe space with roof, with sanitation, with running water, with electricity, free from the threat of water, land or air pollution, free from NATO bombs in which to try to feed, clothe and house their children. That's what those words ought to mean, safe space. You know, and the genocide in Gaza, I think, highlights the obscenity of the misuse of terms like that in really no uncertain terms. So when we arrive at transgenderism in the modern form, it's really, uh, I call it identity politics squared. <laughs> You know, with this movement, identity politics have really reached their absurd apotheosis. And ironically, I find it ironic, its arrival has upset no one more than the leading proponents of bourgeois feminism and black nationalism. Because after all, how can militant feminists project, protect their sphere from evil men if a man can now proclaim himself a woman at the drop of a hat? And where does the fashion for self-identifying lead once the principle has been seeded? What if white people start identifying as black? Sounds like a joke, but it's actually happening. What if Gentiles start identifying as Jews? What if young women 
who might have grown up to be lesbians have a sex change instead and identify as straight men. It sounds ridiculous, right? But these are really things that people are really genuinely fighting over. Um, there really genuinely are these cases. I saw a weirdly horrific story of a young man who'd had a series of operations to transform his appearance because in his mind he identified as Korean and he wanted to look like Korean. So this is what is being done to our people. The sight of feminist campaigners arguing vehemently that women don't have dicks would be funny if it weren't so tragic. And the fact that a simple fact is up for dispute and is attacked as hate speech should send a shiver down every worker's spine. If it doesn't scare you, it bloody well should. We have to understand that ultimately this is an attack on us and our movement. It's an attack on Marxism because Marxism is a science. It's based in materialism, in reality. If material reality no longer exists, nor does Marxism, nor does the science of liberation of the working class, we have to understand that the, the true significance of I am what I think I am, is anti-working class from start to finish. Could the bourgeoisie make it any clearer that it's reached the point of utter degeneracy, that it has nothing at all to offer workers and seeks merely to distract them from the plunge in their living standards than to whip up a controversy out of a simple statement of biological fact? It seems that we are indeed reaching the point Lenin talked about, where even geometrical axioms are up for debate. You know, the bourgeoisie creates confusion in all spheres of life in order to hold back the movement for socialism. So it's the job of socialists to speak the truth, no matter whether it's popular, no matter whether it's fashionable, no matter whether there's a bunch of screaming lunatics telling you that you're a phobe of whatever kind, no matter how unpalatable these truths may be to some sections of the population, and they may genuinely believe the things that they say to you. I'm not saying that people who scream at us are all enemies. But if we're going to enlighten people, we have to show them where they're going wrong. If the working class is going to embrace Marxism, it has to meet Marxism. <laughs> you know, when we accept religious workers, of whom there are very many in the world, and we do accept them into membership, we don't give up our right to propagate materialism out of sensitivity to the feelings of religious members. Mm -hmm. To do so would be to a dereliction of our duty to tell the truth to workers. But we also don't deny the opportunity to such workers to play their part in the struggle. In that most meaningful sense, we are tolerant and we promote unity. We want workers to work together and bring their prejudices with them and iron them out in the course of the struggle and in the course of their studies. We don't promote unity of the kind demanded by left liberal ideologues. The unity of never saying anything that might possibly offend or upset any other worker. Because what does that mean? That means never challenge anybody's prejudice. What does that mean? That means never challenge the bourgeoisie. Given the extent to which wrong ideas have hold of the minds of the masses, to promise never to say anything that might offend someone's prejudice is to promise never to try to make revolution. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're happy to make that promise, fine. See you later. <laughs> I promise you, this party is never going to make that promise. <laughs> it's not possible for a socialist, our consideration for the feelings of those who've been fooled by lies, to agree, for example, that gender dysphoria is a condition that requires lifelong and expensive medical treatments. Harmful medical treatments, profit-driven medical treatments. 
The tiny minority of people who are born hermaphrodite or with abnormal chromosomes, of course, should be supported and offered the best possible chances in life, including whatever medical treatments are necessary and useful. But those do not account for the, for the growing number of young people, exponentially growing, turning up at the doors of transgender clinics in the imperialist countries. The 21st century growth in gender dysphoria is a result of many things. It's the result of the remorseless promotion and enforcement of gender stereotypes on our kids. It's the result of the promotion of identity politics. It's the result of the breakdown of community, very much the result of a breakdown of community, a result of the destruction of class organization and class solidarity. It's a result of the falling living standards, the diminishing life prospects for young workers, the rise of ultra processed food industry and social media direct marketing. So many people in today's decaying capitalist society are isolated, alienated and unhealthy and especially teenagers, who need almost more than anybody the social support network to hold them as they push away from their parents and try to develop as independent adults. And they don't have it today. Gender dysphoria is one of many manifestations of the unhappiness and ill health that this crumbling system is generating on a mass, on an industrial scale. The transgender movement, the ideology, seeks to tell young people who've been let down by a broken society that they are the problem that needs to be fixed. It's not that society is letting you down, you're broken. I've got the pill for you. That the solution to their alienation is to accept bourgeois propaganda about what it means to be a girl or a woman, what it means to be a boy or a man, to accept that the huge discomfort they feel when they hit puberty is, mean, is, is proof that there's something wrong with them and that they need to change their bodies to try to fit in with artificial and damaging constructs. But a lifetime of personal striving for the right body will not bring relief for these sufferers from problems that have been caused by capitalism. The solution can only be a social one, collectively to refuse to accept the roles assigned to us and join the struggle for a society in which people are valued for their contribution and enabled to make one. Socialists are motivated, motivated by a great love for humanity, by a desire to help move society forward to a world in which people are actually treated like human beings not as mere consumers of commodities or as commodities themselves. It pains us, really pains us, to see so many of our people, and especially our young people, having their mental and their physical health destroyed by life in the capitalist system. To see so many young workers turning their alienation in on themselves, so desperate to escape the pain that any mutilation seems acceptable if it might offer some relief. It won't, but they're told it will. The charlatans who push this insidious ideology onto young children, promoting to them the idea that any unwillingness to conform to arbitrary and totally unscientific roles is an indicator that they are in the wrong body and should seek medical help, they are guilty of child abuse. They are amply funded by big business interests that have spotted a market, an opportunity to make huge profits from selling hormone manipulating drugs and expensive operations to workers who are too young to understand the ramifications of their actions, all of which are irreversible, will render them drug dependent and infertile. Under the cover of opposing prejudice and protecting workers' rights, the bourgeoisie is legalizing the mass abuse of and experimentation on children and normalizing this pinnacle achievement of identity politics which has slowly but surely shifted its ground under their loving guidance from racism must be opposed to only a black man can oppose racism. See what I did there? <laughs> to only someone with exactly the same skin tone as mine can appreciate my level of oppression. 
I've been to, I've genuinely been to those meetings. I've been to those meetings. It's, these are real debates people are having. To no one else can understand my personal pain. To no one can question my identity. I am whatever I say I am. And alongside this, we have a campaign of speech suppression. Again, under the guise of progressive tolerance and inclusivity. You know, identity politics, as I said before, they're driving a wedge between privileged workers and the mass of the working class to the disadvantage, actually, of both sections, to the detriment of the working class movement as a whole. By presenting themselves as a progressive force, the promoters of identity politics are forcing the masses into the arms of right-wing demagogues, those false friends of the people whose fake solutions at least recognize the concerns of workers rather than lecturing them about their vocabulary or their privilege and whose refusal to kowtow to, to political correctness police seems like a rebellion that's worth making. It makes them immediately more acceptable to a lot of workers who are tired of being told to shut up every time they open their mouths because they use the wrong word. Another little discussed aspect of this politically <coughs> correct identity discourse is that it makes those who've not been thoroughly steeped in its precepts afraid to speak for fear of using the wrong word or expressing a wrong idea. You know, it's actually becoming glaringly apparent that the zealots of this liberal left identity politics are more likely to show tolerance of mass murder by imperialism than of a worker who uses a word they disapprove of, or of a working class white man who has the temerity to disagree with a black man or a woman. This is a farce. And where this is leading us to is ultimately isolation from one another, from the struggle, from any hope of a better future. You know, the petty bourgeois individualism that drives identity politics is reinforced and its effect is multiplied by a fashion, and remember that all fashion comes from the ruling class. That's how it becomes fashion. <laughs> it's promoted at us. and We follow it like idiots. The fashion for personal purity. That is, that no one should ever be seen to associate, even for a moment, never mind organisationally. Right? You can't be stood next to somebody for long enough to, to, to get a photo. Never mind be in the same organisation with someone who you in any way disagree with politically, or even with anyone who has ever said or done anything you or someone you know, or a hypothetical someone that you might imagine don't or might not like. <laughs> This fear of being morally tarred by association is now enough to stop many so-called self-identifying progressives even speaking on the same platform as someone whose political views are deemed by the arbiters of moral and political correctness to be beyond the pale. This is a recipe for disunity and so, not surprisingly, it's assiduously and incessantly promoted in the capitalist media, which never fail to dig up some personal scandal, scandal against anyone they want to undermine in public life. We see it all the time. And as soon as they've launched a hypocritical, hysterical campaign against somebody, it's now not allowed to ever stand next to that person, anywhere near that person ever again. Doesn't matter what they're fighting for, doesn't matter what, how irrelevant the so-called scandal was to the point at issue. This entirely apolitical approach harms no one but the working class, whose salvation can only come through organization. <laughs> Again, this is something that people have really lost sight of. When they, when they let go of studying Marxism, people become very easy to manipulate, very open to the ruling class's version of what uh, socialist politics are, what progressive politics look like. And they don't even realise it, how manipulated they've become. 
Because without study, you don't have clarity and you're just, you're just buffeted about and you're a, 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 a mess of prejudices that you don't understand. Um, the working class has power in one way alone, through organization. Mm. Say that again. The working class has power in numbers when organized. So if we stop and think about it, it's obvious. It ought to be obvious. That if you're going to organize in a meaningful way, large numbers of people, right? That's what meaningful organization means. I know we're a small group here in a small room, right? But we don't aim to stay small, <laughs> just so you know. Just so you know. It presupposes an ability to unite with people with whom you disagree. Almost any group of workers is bound to consist of individuals who hold widely differing views on all kinds of topics, whose experiences in life, whose approach to life, whose behavioural norms are diverse. The fundamental principle of working class organisation is not that we have to all look, think and feel the same about everything in order to be able to work together. It's that we should unite around a core aim and agree a common programme for action to enable us to rise above or set aside other less important differences. When we differ on important points which are pertinent to the struggle, we take the view that the minority will agree to submit to the majority. That's the only way you can organize a whole load of people. On all other matters, we just agree to disagree. Get over it, mate. That's called being a human being. When it comes to our personal lives, as far as possible, we leave them at the door, unless they're in some way seriously disrupting our ability to organize. What counts in this context, the context of trying to build meaningfully organizations that can take the working class forward to socialism is a person's willingness and ability to contribute to that work. The endlessly disseminated bourgeois line that workers should have nothing to do with any person with whom they have any disagreement or who has merely done something that the ruling class's media have seen fit to create a hypocritical furore over has only one aim, to prevent workers from coming together in effective action. Once again, we see that the ruling class is revealing its understanding of what too many workers have allowed themselves to forget. There is immense power in our numbers if we realize it and learn to use it. Instead, we're constantly encouraged to decrease our circle of association until we reach the purest point, an unsullied and entirely impotent army of one. <laughs> the ghetto mentality of identity politics reinforces and is reinforced by this never talk or listen to anyone who isn't just like you approach. And of course, it's been further fueled by the echo chamber of social media with its friends, followers, likes, retweets and endlessly self-reinforcing algorithms. Unquestioning acceptance of this mindset has led on to the present mania for deplatforming which is particularly prevalent amongst student radicals and which is presented as a progressive act, but which is in point of fact entirely reactionary. So we arrived at a place where the popular perception of progressive politics is self-identifying, personal pronoun choosing, vocabulary, vocabulary pro policing, God, I can't speak, sorry, vocabulary policing Marxists, who on the one hand, demand protection from divergent opinions and difficult debates because <gasps> it might hurt my feelings. Demand safe spaces where they can't have their feelings hurt. While on the other hand, they feel justified in acting with unrestrained viciousness towards every perceived violator of their codes, who all too often seems to be a less privileged worker. And very often their viciousness is backed up by the forces of the state or granted anonymity by some anti-social media platform of choice. True progressives, on the <coughs> other hand, have no interest in stifling debate. We don't need to shout down or abuse our opponents. It's fun sometimes, down the pub to abuse your opponents. 
but we don't need to. Our arguments and our criticisms are political. And we will take any and every opportunity to make them before the working class. We will certainly not refuse to speak on a platform alongside a speaker on the basis of a disagreement. This is merely to guarantee that misinformed workers will never get the chance to change their minds. How will they know and understand what the arguments are if no one is ever allowed to stand in front of them for fear of being associated with someone else who's lying to them? Why would we as communists deny workers the chance to hear what we have to say when Marxism holds the key to their liberation? We know it. They need to know it. So it's our job, isn't it, to take it wherever we can. More to the point, communists understand that the real target of deplatforming is us. Once the principle has been established against a universally accepted demon, the fascists, right? And in fact, if you think about demonizing fascists, not only is it really easy for the ruling class to do this, not that many real ones uh, in the ordinary working class, but the fascist program, more or less diplomatically expressed, can in any event be heard from the lips of perfectly respectable bourgeois politicians and commentators all the time. Mm -hmm. You can repress a few far-right organisations, but their ideas are everywhere. <laughs> because they're the ideas of the ruling class. Once they've established that principle that they're doing it on behalf of society against nasty extremism, they can extend it to anyone the ruling class wants to silence. And we're seeing that right now in front of our eyes with the extension of the definition of extremism and the scope of the prevent scheme specifically now to include socialist and communist ideology. You know, rigorous no-platforming has been a feature of life for real revolutionaries ever since Marxism first reared its terrifying, if you're the ruling class, head. But the rebranding of this censorship as something progressive really marks a new low for the self-identifying progressives of the identity politics fraternity. And finally, I just want to underline, I guess I've probably been saying it the whole time, but just to remind us, in the end, there's only one answer. We've got to build a movement that's based on scientific <laughs> socialism. You know, long before they evolved into modern homo sapiens, our early ancestors took their first steps away from the rest of the animal kingdom with the capture and the control of fire. With fire, they kept themselves warm, they kept predators at bay, they began to cook their food, they began a long process of development that resulted in the modern human brain and ultimately in modern human civilization. In our struggle against capitalism, Marxist science is to the working class what fire was to early man. It arms us against the onslaught of capitalist propaganda. As we strive to build the organization we need and to combat the stifling influence of bourgeois ideology in our movement, we should always bear in mind that real liberty of the individual, which is the watchword of bourgeois and petty bourgeois philosophers, is unattainable for the masses without socialism. And I just want to close with a quote from Joseph Stalin, like I opened, good old Uncle Joe. He gave an interview <coughs> to an American journalist in 1936. <coughs> and he said this. We did not build this society in order to restrict personal liberty, but in order that the human individual may feel really free. We built it for the sake of real personal liberty, liberty without quotation marks. It is difficult for me to imagine what personal liberty is enjoyed by an unemployed person who goes about hungry and cannot find a job. Real liberty can exist only where exploitation has been abolished, where there is no oppression of some by others, where there is no unemployment and poverty, where a man is not haunted by the fear of being tomorrow deprived of work, of home and of bread. Only in such a society is real and not paper, personal and every other liberty possible. Thank you, comrades.
All right. I'm just personally in awe of how sharp, laser sharp, this tool is that, um, that carves and cuts through all these theories, all these little analyses that form the discourses that try to, to bring us guilt, yes? And how much this tool is so lucid and so clear and enables us not to feel lulled, not to feel dulled. And thank you, Jyoti, for using Lenin. Thank you, Jyoti, for using Stalin. Thank you for showing us how to use this tool so we don't get lost. And I think that's the problem with a lot of parties that don't want to go there. They will either not touch the issue of identity politics in order not to alienate young people. So they refuse their responsibility towards the young people who come to their parties because they don't want to pick up Lenin, because they don't know how to pick up Marx anymore. You know, all this analysis in academia, all this post-structuralism, all this post-modernism, that thankfully you didn't go into, because that would create more, more confusion, you know, more new terminologies, more new isms. This all that this Marxism thing they're doing nowadays, they create and invent more isms that harden this individualism. So thank you, Jyoti, for doing this so clearly. You gave us a tool in this book to rec recommend to everyone. If every student who is getting into university or any student at school could have access to this, is clearly very accessibly written and not another book on isms. Uh, I think there is so many windmills in people's minds that they fight in order not to see the real enemy. And the guilt that you mentioned, such an astute trick of the ruling class to make us feel collectively guilty for the crimes of the ruling class and turn us impotent completely. On the contrary, we are very proud as working class that is organized the moment you get organized, you see three women in this party, right? But of course, no one talks about it because we don't consider it a big issue, like other organizations would do. And once you're a communist, you're not seeing really. They, the bourgeoisie puts a smoke screen on us as well. But we have Ella Rue, who has contributed the beautiful ending to this book and basically tells you what is to be done. Once you realize all this, get organized in a party. What is a communist party? Is function. And this is what they don't want us to get to. And you will spend years in academia and you will have a PhD and you will keep teaching and without ever being able to combat fascism. And why did we put, again, I, I go back to, to this amazing sculpture. Because this is the Soviet Union that defeated fascism. The only people who can have a higher moral ground are the people who have fought fascism in history. And we are so proud to be in this room and to have Stalin and Marx and Engels and Lenin being women. <laughs> you know, because they don't let us pick up these tools and use them for ourselves and for our own liberation. Some people go there before us and they create so much confusion so we don't know where to start. We are very proud that we are, as Jyoti said, the real feminists, the proletarian feminists, the real anti-racists, but get arrested for racism, right? <laughs> for speaking That's against genocide. Is, it's protection of minorities. So thank you for not engaging in culture wars, not turning people into another fight club, because this is what they create. They create on one side those who um, want us to feel guilty or who spread this notion of guilt. And as a reaction to this, you have this movement that, you know, people like Peterson, this toxicity, you know, that again targets the working class from the other side and tells them, no, actually, 
you have to be a proud racist. You have to be a proud capitalist. And everything functions within capitalism. So what Jyoti reminded us today, that liberalism is a partner in crime with fascism because it prevents the working class from fighting fascism decisively, is super important for us mm -hmm. to take as a, uh, as a lesson for the, the, the struggles that are coming. Thank you.